Alex, you have uh, about 40 minutes. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Junjie. Um, and thank you all for, for being here. Thanks for the organizer. Thanks to the organizer for, for the opportunity to present. So this and for uh, thanks to Chengzi for uh, agreeing to discuss the paper. So this is joint work with uh, Andrea Mantovani, who I saw is in the room, and Shiva Shekhar from Tilburg University, um, uh, third degree price discrimination in two-sided markets. So uh, what are we talking about? So we're talking about um, price discrimination by platforms, which is um, a practice which is uh, quite common. Uh, so let me give you uh, a few examples. For instance, uh, if you consider the Amazon marketplace, uh, you will see that Amazon uh, charges different uh, transaction fees depending on the category of products that is sold, right? So here you have a table. So you see that it goes from 8% for appliances to something like 45% for the accessories to Amazon devices. Uh, and, and other platforms also uh, charge different fees uh, depending on, on the seller's or developer's characteristics. So for instance, Apple or Google's um, app stores charge different commissions depending on um, the revenue of the of the seller, right? So uh, it used to be only 30%, but since uh, last year, uh, they've changed and now uh, Amazon and um, sorry Apple and Google charge 15% commission if it's if the revenue per year is uh, less than 1 million 30% uh, if it's um, if it's above uh, you have other examples in the video game industries for instance Microsoft is going to charge uh, different fees depending on whether what you sell is a game or not um, in other industries as well credit cards also uh, charge different fees depending on the uh, what kind of merchants we're, we're talking about. So the, the very basic questions that we ask are, what are the, the effects on welfare of such practices of price discrimination by a platform? And uh, what we find interesting is to actually contrast these results with the uh, traditional price discrimination, so in markets which are one-sided, so without network effects. So. Just to make make it clear what we are looking uh, what we are looking at. So here's the the standard setup of third degree price discrimination. So in third degree price discrimination, you would have a firm that faces a, a group of consumers. Or well, when it cannot discriminate, so it, it it has to charge the same price to everyone. Um, so here we call it FU. You're going to see why we use a F because uh, later on it will be the the developers that that pay a fee. But so. You have this market, so under uniform pricing, you charge a single price to everyone, and you contrast that with a price discrimination where you can actually distinguish between the strong market and the weak market, and you can charge different fees, uh, where usually the, the fee in the or the price in the strong market would be higher than in the weak market. So what we do instead is we add another side to the story. So we're going to add the consumer side, so there's going to be a population of uh, sellers. We're going to call them sellers and, and buyers on the, on the right. And so when the, when the platform cannot price discriminate, it's going to charge the same price for every seller and the same price to every buyer. And then there's going to be network effects uh, across the groups, right? So the buyers like that, that sellers, the more sellers they are, the, 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 the happier the buyers are. And we're going to contrast that uh, with the situation where the platform can actually distinguish uh, the sellers based on a uh, characteristic and so separate them into a strong market and a weak market, charge different prices. We're going to maintain the assumption that buyers pay the same price for now, but it's not very important, but uh, it makes our life uh, easier. right? And so you're going to have network effects as well. Okay, so before... Before I state what uh, our main results are, um, I think it's it's interesting to go back to what we know from the classic uh, results in, in the early literature on uh, third degree price discrimination. So the, the first papers, uh, you know, go back to the, the, the early 20th century, uh, the first half of the century with uh, Pigou or, or Robinson, um, we, who have the, the, the first important results. And in particular, so, so there are, there are two cases uh, to consider. So first, there is the case where absent 
price discrimination, the weak market would not be served. So in that case, price discrimination allows to serve a new market. And so it's going to lead to uh, an improvement um, in terms of welfare and also a Pareto improvement, a weak Pareto improvement in the sense that the consumers in the strong market, their, uh, their, the price that they pay will not change, but the weak markets, they can be served under price discrimination. So it's something to keep in mind. This is not what I have on the, on the slides. What I have on the slides is the other interesting case where under uniform pricing, both markets would be served. So in that case, there's an important result, which is that when you have linear demands, then uh, price discrimination is going to lead to the same quantity overall. So the aggregate quantity is going to stay the same. And that means that welfare goes down because there's a misallocation. So some consumers in the, in the weak market are going to buy, uh, even though their willingness to pay is lower than some consumers in the strong market who are priced out. The welfare goes down. Um, Later on, uh, this kind of work has, be, has been extended to more general demand functions. So uh, the, uh, I think the, the latest uh, kind of, uh, uh, paper, the, the more general approach is by uh, Aguirre, Cohen, and Vickers, who provide conditions on convexity for, uh, uh, of the demand for the quantity or the welfare to go up or down. Okay, so what we're going to do for tractability, we're going to focus on the case with linear demand because what we do is we add network effects, so it makes things um, quickly and tractable. Uh, but I'm going to discuss, uh, of course, the robustness to uh, how general the, the results are, but it, it, this will be quite uh, informal. Um, and, and later on, there's a, there's a, a, a big literature also on uh, price discrimination and platforms. Uh, maybe I'll come back to that uh, later on. Uh, actually, I should have put the, this slide first. The, the main results, what we find uh, is that uh, when demand is linear on both sides, so that is both on the buyer and the seller side, uh, we find that price discrimination is going to lead to increased participation on both sides. So we're going to have more buyers and more sellers in equilibrium. And this is also going to lead to an increased welfare, right? And a uh, kind of a striking result uh, is that price discrimination may also result in strict Pareto improvement. I emphasize the strict because we know that price discrimination can result in weak Pareto improvement. I, I described the story when the, uh, the, strong, the, the weak market was not served. Uh, but here, what we find is that even though uh, some consumers may end up, or some sellers in this case, may end up having to pay a higher fee, they may be strictly better off under price discrimination than under uniform pricing. And we also discussed the, the optimal pricing strategy um, of the platform. So um, without further ado, uh, unless there are questions, but uh, I think I, I'm, I'm gonna stop uh, describing the model. So we have a, a monopolist platform. Uh, that matches, that helps interactions between buyers and sellers. Okay, we call them buyers and sellers. Um, but actually, we're not going to model the inter, you know, we are, we're not going to open the black box of the interaction between the buyer and the seller. So we're going to use a reduced form uh, way to, to model how buyers and sellers interact. Um, and the platform charges participation fees on each side. Okay, so... Um, I will discuss later on why we don't do ad valorem fees, which are uh, quite common, uh, but uh, I would say the main reason is for tractability, so it's easier to explain things with, uh, uh, with membership fees. Okay, so the, the fees are going to be P for the buyers, the price, and the fee F for the sellers. So on the seller side, we have two groups, L and H. And there's a unit mass of, uh, of each group. A seller of type H gets a profit per interaction with a buyer of theta H, which is going to be larger than the profit that a low type seller gets for each buyer. Okay, And both are strictly positive. There is no competition among the sellers. So you have a unit mass of sellers that sell independent goods, right? So there's no congestion or... or or things like that. And uh, sellers are also heterogeneous with respect to their participation costs. So the cost of uh, signing up to the platform uh, on top of the membership fee, uh, which we assume is uniformly distributed on zero one and independent of the type. 
So that means that the profit of a seller of type J is going to be uh, theta J times the number of buyers minus the fee that this type has to pay to the platform minus the uh, participation cost. On the other side of the market, we have uh, buyers, a unit mass of buyers, um, who have a standalone value V for the platform. Okay, so think of the iPhone. So even if there are no apps on the iPhone, you can still uh, use it to, uh, to browse the web or to make phone calls. And then um, buyers also enjoy interacting with sellers. Um, and we assume that, they, um, that buyers get a benefit B per seller, which uh, in the baseline model, we're going to assume that this is independent of the seller's type. And later on, um, uh, we relax this assumption and we, uh, we look at the maybe the more plausible case in which buyers prefer to interact with high type sellers than with low type sellers. Uh, which is, uh, I think, a, a natural thing to look at. But for clarity, I think it's better to start with the case where um, buyers are indifferent about the type of the sellers. And the buyers also have an outside option, which is also uniformly distributed on zero one. So that the utility of a buyer is the standalone utility plus the network benefit times the number of sellers minus the price paid to the platform, minus the participation cost. OK, so in terms of pricing, we distinguish two regimes. So uh, under price discrimination, the platform can set a different fee depending on the type of the seller. So it can observe the type of the seller and set FL uh, potentially different from FH. But buyers, they pay the same price PD. Whereas under uniform pricing, you've got the constraint that the platform has to set the same fee for sellers, FU, and the buyers pay the same price. Uh, all buyers pay uniform price, PU. And we're going to assume that the parameters are such that we always have interior solutions. Right, So we're going to avoid dealing with the corner solutions. Uh, so we, we discussed that in the paper. Uh, and also, importantly, we're going to focus on the region where, even under uniform pricing, you would have some L-type sellers who would be active in the market, right? So we're going to kind of assume away the scenario where price discrimination allows the platform to serve a new market, to serve the, 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 the low types, right? So we're going to assume that they can be served, some of them can be served uh, even under uniform pricing. Um, okay, so if there are no questions on the on the setup, I guess it's uh, it's fairly standard. Um, let me uh, let me discuss the how we compute the demand. Uh, so because we have uniform distribution of a participation cost, means that the number of uh, buyers that are active on the platform, given price uh, given a price PU and a number of seller NS, this is V plus BNS minus PU. And the total number of sellers is going to be equal to the number of high type sellers plus the number of low type sellers, um, which is this expression. Right. So here, um, one could do, you know, you just write the profit uh, as a function of the prices given those demands and you solve the rational expectation equilibrium. Um, that would be fine. That would give us the result. But instead, we find it more illuminating to, uh, to use actually inverse demand. And uh, hopefully, I will convince you that, that using inverse demand is going to is, is useful to understand the intuition of, of what's going on. So instead, we're going to assume that the, the platform chooses direct, directly the participation levels. So it's going to choose how many sellers it wants to attract and how many buyers it wants to attract. And then the prices. So this is in the uniform case, in the uniform pricing case, the pricing will adjust such that um, given those uh, su su such that given those prices, uh, these are the realized uh, participations. Okay, so we simply invert the system and get the, these uh, inverse demand functions. Now the platform's profit is then the price of the the price to the buyers times the number of buyers plus price to the sellers times number of sellers. And the first order condition is the following. So uh, for the number of buyers, 
um, we have the standard marginal revenue, traditional marginal revenue, and then we have a, an extra term that captures the, the network externality, right? So that every time you add a new buyer to the platform, uh, that increases uh, um, seller's willingness to pay so that the, the price is going to increase. And uh, you multiply that by the number of sellers that are uh, active on the platform to, to get the, the gain to the platform. And a similar expression for the, the first order condition with respect to the number of sellers. Okay, so graphically, uh, we have two increasing curves. So on the x-axis, I have the number of buyers. On the y-axis, I have the number of sellers. And so here I, I plot as a function of the number of buyers, how many sellers does the platform want to attract? So this is the blue line. And here is how many buyers you want to attract as a, as a function of the number of sellers that are on the platform. And a remark is that, and that's going to play a role, is that both of these curves uh, have to be increasing, right? So the number of buyers and the number of sellers are complementary. The intuition is fairly, uh, fairly straightforward. So uh, an extra buyer is going to be more valuable if you have many uh, sellers on the platform, because then you can increase the price and it's going to be multiplied by a larger number. Right. Okay, so now um, what happens under price discrimination? So under price discrimination, um, given the, the, again, the uniform distribution, we have uh, a demand participation level for buyers as a function of the number of low type sellers and high type sellers that are in, on the platform. And uh, you also have a participation of the low type and participation of the high type as a function of the, the fees that they have to pay. Again, we're going to invert the system and get the, the inverse demands. Uh, so that the this is going to be the price for the, um, the, the buyers. And now uh, there's going to be a, a price for the low type seller and a price for the high type sellers. So the difference between the two cases is that under price discrimination, basically, the platform uh, not only chooses how many sellers in total it attracts, but it can choose the composition of the seller pool, right? So, uh, so that's going to play a role. And the platform's profit is price uh, times uh, to the buyers times number of buyers plus um, the fees times um, the number of sellers of each type. And uh, here is the, the first order condition, uh, and this is the one I will discuss uh, uh, that, that plays a role. Uh, the first order condition with respect to the number of buyers. So again, we have this traditional marginal revenue. And then you have uh, this effect, which is how much value does one extra buyer create on the other side? And this value will be extracted by the platform, right? So basically an extra buyer, it, it allows to increase the price for the, the low type sellers multiplied by the number of low type sellers plus the same for the, the high type sellers. Um, the first order condition for the, uh, the sellers do, does not change compared to the, the case with the uh, uniform pricing. Uh, so now what I want you to do is I want you to look at these two expressions. So this is the first order condition under price discrimination. And this is the first order condition under uniform pricing. You see that the first term is the same as traditional marginal revenue, but the, the second term is different. So the red expression is how much value the platform can extract under price discrimination for each new buyer that it attracts. And so basically the point, a very simple point observation that we make, and that's gonna, that's gonna generate our results basically, is that the platform is better able to extract the value of an extra buyer on the seller side, right? Because now uh, it will uh, extract the full value. So if you attract one extra um, buyer, you can extract the full value to the low types plus the full value to the high types. Whereas under uniform pricing, uh, basically if uh, one extra buyer comes on the platform, there's gonna be an increase in the price which is gonna be such that the total number of sellers remains the same, but there's gonna be more high type sellers and fewer low type sellers. 
and the, the difference will um, will be I mean the sum of the two will be equal to, to zero uh, but the surplus extraction is imperfect in that case so what does that what does that mean so first um, actually uh, and this is going back to the the traditional results from Pigou or Robinson. If we fix the number of buyers and we compare the level of participation under uniform pricing and under uh, discrimination, if we compare the, the, the participation by sellers, then we have the classic result that the total quantity remains the same. Right, so under uniform pricing, the total quantity of uh, sellers is uh, this. It's going to be equal to uh, the total quantity of sellers un uh, under price discrimination. So what that means is that, so I, the the continuous lines are the, the the previous one. So this is the the solution in the case of uniform pricing. But now the dashed line is the, the optimal uh, strategy under price discrimination. So it means that for a given number of buyers, the platform wants to attract the same total number of sellers. So the, the curve um, is located exactly uh, in the same place. Now, the second step is using our previous remark on uh, the fact that you can better extract surplus under uh, discrimination, it means that there's going to be a stronger incentive to attract buyers because each new buyer can generate more revenue for the platform. So this means that for a given number of sellers on the platform, the platform wants to attract more buyers when it can discriminate. And so graphically, this means that the, the red line shifts to the right. Okay, so for a given number of, of sellers, you want to attract more buyers, which means that the optimal solution is necessarily going to be uh, greater. You know, both participation of buyers and participation of sellers is necessarily going to be above the case of uniform pricing. So this is our first proposition is that under price discrimination, participation increases on both sides. Um, now, here, I think it's useful to uh, to pause and to, uh, well, first, if you have any question, uh, don't, don't hesitate. Um, but uh, if not, let me take a moment to discuss how robust this insight is. Because here, we're using the fact that demands are linear to uh, to use the fact that basically the, the total quantity doesn't change. The fact that the blue line doesn't change, it comes directly from the, the assumption of linear demands. Now, when we have non-linear demands, we no longer have this result that the total quantity is the same, right? So the, the first step of the reasoning no longer works. And so basically what we say is that provided that price discrimination does not lead to too large a drop in the uh, desired participation of sellers, then the proposition will hold, right? So uh, the proposition would hold if the dashed blue line was slightly below the, um, the continuous blue line, right? But of course, if, if uh, the dashed blue line is too much below, then we no longer have this result that participation on both sides um, increases. And so there we can we can directly apply the result by Aguirre, um, uh, Cowan, and Vickers because they give conditions on the convexity of demand um, uh, for price discrimination to increase output. And so if output increases, then it means that the dashed blue line is going to be above the continuous blue line. And so that would work. The, what we require is that it doesn't decrease too much. But in any case, um, I think a more general point is that um, participation is less likely, overall participation is less likely to decrease with price discrimination compared to a traditional markets without network effects, right? So if you want to take really what is the robust insight, it's this one. Now, in terms of welfare, um, we can show that, well, the platform is going to be better off. Of course, that's by reveal preference. Uh, the buyers, that's a, 
or so are going to be better off because the, the participation increases, so they must be better off. And the low value sellers are also always better off with price discrimination. But what we find uh, striking is that uh, total welfare always increases under price discrimination with linear demand. So this is a big contrast with uh, the traditional markets where, remember, so quantity remains the same and welfare always goes down. So here, quantity increases and welfare goes up. So this is quite uh, quite a stark contrast. Now, um, another striking result that we have is that um, provided that the network effects, uh, precisely the, the how much the high type sellers value each buyer and how much the buyers value sellers, provided these two parameters are large enough, then the high type sellers are going to be better off under price discrimination. So this means that in that case, we would have a strict Pareto improvement. And this generally doesn't happen in a standard model of third degree price discrimination. In general, consumers in the strong market, they end up paying a higher price. And so they are either worse off or when, you know, when price doesn't change, they are indifferent. Um, as a few, actually, we, we became aware of these papers uh, recently, but there's a couple of exceptions in the, uh, in the literature. So this paper by Nahata Ostazewski and, and Sahu in 1990, where basically they have the profit functions that are not single peaked. And so in that case, they can show that you sometimes have a, a strict Pareto improvement. Another, another which is more related to what we do, a paper by Osman and McKee Mason in, 90, in 1988, um, they use uh, the, the model of market with economies of scale. In that case, uh, they can sh they show that you can have um, a strict Pareto improvement. So of course, you know network effect, economies of scale, it's it's related. Actually, the mechanism is 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 a bit different because in their story, um, basically. Uh, once you can price discriminate, you're going to lower the price to the, the weak market. So that's gonna, that means that you're going to serve more consumers there. And because you serve more consumers, it means that the marginal cost is going to go down. And so this gives you, if it goes down enough, it gives you an incentive to also lower the price on the strong market. This is a, a different mechanism, but of course, it's related. Um, am I doing on time? Okay. In terms of pricing, um, we identify several regimes, uh, so several situations. The typical one, I put quote unquote typical, um, because it's so, you know, uh, when we plot the parameters, this is the, the largest one. Uh, and this is also the, the, the more intuitive one, um, is such that the low type sellers are going to pay a lower fee under price discrimination than under uniform pricing, and the high type sellers are going to pay a higher price. So in that case, what about consumers? Well, they are going to um, pay a higher price when the network effects are large enough. But when the network effects are smaller, then basically um, they have to, I mean, the platform finds it optimal to lower the price. So Think of maybe that case first, the case where B is small, so that there's not much of a network effect on the buyer side. So remember that the platform finds it optimal to increase participation on both sides. So if you want, if the if the buyers don't care much about sellers, if you want to attract more buyers, you have to lower their price. On the other hand, if buyers value sellers a lot, then actually you don't necessarily have to lower the price to attract more buyers because there's, they are going to be attracted by the fact that you have more sellers. So there's going to be a feedback um, effects that, that allow the platform to attract more buyers, even though the price to buyers goes up because of the increased participation by sellers. A second regime, which was uh, more surprising to us, is one where actually all fees increase on the price discrimination. So this happened when theta L is intermediate and B, B, uh, B sorry, is large enough. Um, so when this happens, uh, we find that uh, buyers are subsidized, both under uniform pricing or price discrimination. And so in that case, uh, discrimination is going to lead the platform to increase the subsidy to buyers. Uh, and notice that uh, an interesting result is that 
all sellers pay a higher price and yet they are better off right because of the increased participation result uh, finally there's also you know anything can happen so there's also well, almost anything because actually in this model fl is always going to be below fh but uh it could be the case that both types end up paying a lower fee under discrimination than under uniform pricing when this happens uh, we find that um, the sellers are subsidized. So that means I should have added this inequality. So FU is also negative. And in this case, um, the platform wants to increase the price to buyers when it can price discriminate. Um, so that's it for the baseline results. And so in the remaining uh, five minutes or so that I have, unless there are questions on this, uh, I will discuss some extensions. I think there's a question in the in the in the chat room. You want it? Uh, yeah. Uh, I think I think Luis wants to ask uh, probably the compare statics results whether this traditional results is the case when some of the parameter is zero, right? So okay. and then you have a strict Pareto. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Let me take that after. Uh, if that's okay. okay. Um, sure, sure. So, uh, uh, okay, in terms of uh, robustness and extensions, uh, we look at uh, three main extensions, uh, and our results are mostly robust to, uh, to this. Uh, so the first extension that we look at is uh, one with heterogeneity in um, how much consumers value different types of sellers. Right? So we're going to allow consumers to prefer uh, to interact with high type sellers. Um, then there's going to be, um, we look also at ad valor and fees. And a third uh, extension that we look at is uh, one-sided pricing. That is what happens when the platform cannot, um, cannot charge a price to consumers. So, uh, you know, the assumption that uh, B is the same, that, that consumers are indifferent about which buyer they interact with, of course, it's it's not very, you know, it's not very natural. It can be micro-founded. We provide some micro-foundation, but it's it's probably more plausible to assume that the buyers would prefer to interact with the high-type sellers, right? So it's easier to, to find. So if you if you think of the high-type as having a, a either a high-quality or a a lower cost and you endogenize the price. So in equilibrium, you would find that buyers prefer to interact with the high type sellers. Um, and so we have a lemma that, that says that basically um, the platform uh, charges, so, so the platform can, you know, in the baseline model, the platform always charges a higher price to the high types. This may be uh, actually counterfactual. I mean, in some in some markets, what we observe is that actually the the popular uh, app developers are uh, charge a lower commission or, or things like that. Uh, so when you allow B to be different depending on the type, then you can find this result because actually what matters is the difference between how much uh, a developer benefits from or a seller benefits from interacting with a buyer. And how much the buyer would um, uh, would like um, this uh, interacting with this seller, and so basically, the more value you generate either for you or for the other side, uh, the lower the fee that you. Um, uh, no, sorry. Uh, so if you if you generate if you generate a high revenue or if you don't generate a lot of value for the the buyer, then you're going to pay a, a higher fee. And so this is consistent, for instance, with uh, examples such as a Steam that that actually uh, charges more for the the less popular games. Um, and we have a result that actually the, the the results on participation, you know, with the, the graphical analysis. So you have to change a bit the proof, but it goes through. So participation is gonna is gonna increase. Now the result on welfare is not going to to hold so that there is a region where welfare go down goes down but actually what we find and this is a numerical exercise but is that in general when welfare goes down it goes down by very little so it's usually less than 1% for you know whatever that figure means but you know given the parameters that we use it's less than 1% 
whereas the when it goes up it can go up by um, by a lot so, so more than sometimes more than 100 percent so uh, so so we feel like uh, this is this broadly confirms our our results um the second uh, extension that i want to discuss with you is uh, ad valorem fees because in all the examples that i've used uh, actually in practice the platforms use ad valorem fees so and in our model we have membership fees so i would say that there are three reasons uh, three main reasons why we do that the first one is attractability right so it's easier to uh, you know this analysis uh, uh, and trans transparency. I, I think the, the analysis with membership fees is, is uh, very clear, very easy to understand. Um, now, there's also a, a, an interesting paper by um, by Drew Wong and and Wright um, who show that ad valorem fees they already uh, represent some kind of price discrimination. Uh, so that if we really want to understand the effects of price discrimination, starting from a situation where there is even uniform ad valorem fees, it would still be some kind of price discrimination because, of course, the more you sell, uh, the more you pay. You know, it's proportional to how much you sell. And finally, uh, it is optimal in our setup to not use ad valorem fees, to use membership fees. I mean, if price discrimination is possible, you prefer to do uh, membership fees. But still, you know uh, these um, these reasons. If we put aside these reasons, uh, what we show is that um, our results in terms of welfare and participation are going to go through, even if the platform uh, charges ad valorem fees uh, to sellers. But the thing also, I, I, maybe I should have added it, is that you know with ad valorem fees you introduce also consider distortions in terms of pricing. Uh, of course, if the marginal cost is not zero, you're going to have some double marginalization, and this makes uh, things a bit more messy. Um, finally, in the, in the case where the, the platform cannot charge consumers, then we find that the total participation goes up. Uh, now, welfare doesn't always go up, right? So it has, the network effects have to be hard, large enough. I mean, basically, you have one fewer instrument, so you're not going to be able to do as well. But we still have the possibility of a strict Pareto improvement. So to wrap up, um, what we do in this paper, we present what we think is a very simple model of price discrimination by a two-sided platform. Uh, we show that with linear demand, uh, price discrimination increases welfare and can even lead to a strict Pareto improvement. Um, and uh, one kind of uh, uh, counterintuitive result is that um, even when uh, consumers uh, pay a higher price, uh, they may be better off uh, because of the, the increased participation by sellers. Uh, thank you for your attention, uh, and I'm looking forward to Cheng's discussion. Uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to discuss Alex's paper. Um, I really enjoy reading the paper. I think this is uh, similar to a lot of Alex's work, uh, identifies very important question and uh, provides some uh, interesting trade-off that um, very relevant um, answers to uh, to the practice. So I just have a few uh, comments. Um, so I think first, uh, when we talk about like dominant platforms, um, uh, which holds a different sides of small users, probably the total user surplus would be a better measure, welfare measure than consumer surplus or the total welfare. And actually in this model, um, the results obtained is actually stronger than uh, that the total user surplus can be increased uh, on the price discrimination because it's, because actually on the price discrimination, the authors find that um, both sides participation will increase. So that actually means both sides are better off. So that would be stronger than just the increase of total user surplus. So this could be something uh, highlighted in the in the paper. And we know that this total user surplus is actually more difficult than the total welfare uh, because the platform would be always better off. Uh, otherwise, it will not use the uh, price discrimination in equilibrium. So um, um, I think that's just something interesting. Also, uh, another benefit of focusing on total user surplus is it might have some implications for extending, sort of generalizing the model uh, beyond the linear demand. Uh, because here, if you only focus on the total user surplus, then um, it seems that what happened to the buyers and uh, the low type sellers are quite robust. So the only problem is what happens to the 
the high type sellers. But uh, that could be probably you borrow some techniques from the Agir, Kowan, and Vickers. Uh, but then be because your current result is stronger than the total user surplus. So if you can't get that result uh, with certain conditions, but that condition could be actually sufficient for getting an improved total user surplus. Right? So I think that might be a way to, uh, to generalize the, the insight. Um, the third point is that, um, uh, so I find one result that's particularly strong is that uh, the seller participation always increase on the price discrimination, which is independent of NH and NL, which is the size of uh, uh, high top sellers and the low top sellers. I'm just wondering whether, so I mean, imagine a scenario where NH is almost one and NL is almost zero. So basically almost all sellers are high type. Uh, do we still get that the seller uh, participation will always increase? Uh, so um, I'm just wondering whether this scenario is actually covered by the assumption one or um, actually um, uh, also covered in the discussion of um, corner solutions. And finally, um, given this is a two-sided market model, uh, so I'm wondering whether uh, the platform have any incentive to offer a negative price to any of the groups, because here you have actually three groups, right? So the buyers, the high top sellers, and the low top sellers. So it might be quite interesting to uh, consider this kind of thing, especially in a competing environment when uh, an entrant probably can use a subsidy to uh, overcome certain disadvantages as an entrant, uh, but then the issue is which group should the low price or the negative price to uh, be used to target. Right? So I think that will be a, a quite relevant question for uh, uh, for business for platform business. Right, that's all I have. Thank you.